the point because we still have a, another briefing this evening at 1800 hours um, from the Auditor General um, on related matters. So I'll request that we appointed and um, deal with the salient issues um, of this matter uh, as, as is necessary. All right, Dr. Dex, um, over to you. Okay. Uh, Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Members, um, media present, uh, members of public who are listening at home, good afternoon. Let me start by thanking you for having responded expeditiously and with diligence to my letter dated the 22nd of December 2021. And the request therein that the President of the Republic be summoned to appear before the Standing Committee of Public Accounts. In your letter to me dated Chairperson on the 18th of January 2022, you are correct to state that it is established practice for the committee that when a member of parliament petitions the committee on a matter related to public accounts, the MP is afforded an opportunity to address the committee so that an informed decision can be made on the way forward. Thus, we now have the meeting, and I think it must be emphasized for the sake of balance and fairness that this is not something extraordinary. It is standard practice for you to have called this meeting and for me to make this formal submission. Section 48 of the Constitution oblige each one of us as members of the National Assembly to affirm our faithfulness to the Republic and obedience to the Constitution. My submission must not be seen as a betrayal of my party or my leaders, but an act of faithfulness to my country and to the Constitution. Honorable Chairperson, having established this, let me acknowledge that it is no small matter to make a request for the President of the Republic to be, appear before this committee or any committee. In every instance, this is true. And for me personally, as a loyal member of the African National Congress, it is even more so to call for the president of my party and the president of the Republic to be summoned to appear before this committee. I agonized a lot before I took this difficult decision. I certainly did not take it lightly. My initial letter to my initial letter to you of the 22nd of December 2021 reflects the weight of responsibility that I felt when I wrote the, that letter. In the first paragraph, I say that I write the letter with a heavy heart and a sense of duty to my country. I then refer to the widely circulated audio clip of the ANC NEC meeting in which the Honorable President Ramaphosa admitted that he is aware that public funds were or are misused for public party political activity. I have also subsequently noted that the national spokesperson of the African National Congress, Mr. Pule Mabe, when he was approached for comment by the media about this recording, that he denied, that he, that he did not deny the authenticity of this recording. He just bewailed the fact that it had gone public nor did any other ANC member, especially including those who were present in the meeting, officially, formally, or informally deny the authenticity of the recording and that President Raposa had in fact said what he is heard to be saying in that recording. Honorable Chairperson, the seriousness of what we have to deal with cannot be overemphasized. What President Ramaphosa stated in the audio clip is that he has knowledge about what is clearly the abuse or misappropriation of public funds. We cannot beat about the bush about this. The misuse of public funds is an act of criminality. To put it simply, Chair, it's a criminal offense. It's a crime. Furthermore, we all know that it is also illegal, and I emphasize a crime for anyone 
who is aware of such a crime not to report it to the authorities. In short, what the president admitted to is that he is committing a crime by not having reported this act of criminality that is known to him. However, the president goes even further by trying to make this criminal conduct of his, to which he admits personally, seem to be virtuous by saying that he will rather fall on his sword than to report it or that the public should get to know about it. This already very serious, serious situation is made wor worse by the fact that President Ramaphosa had a unique opportunity and duty when he appeared under oath before the Commission of Inquiry into allegations of state capture, corruption, and fraud in the public sector, including organs of state, to report his knowledge about this serious crime. This willful act of criminal omission to my mind amounts to perjury and cast a serious cloud over the findings of the State Capture Commission that is now in the process of being released in, in, phase stage, um, in a phase manner. In my opening paragraph in the letter to you, I express, I express concern about our overburdened taxpayers. As members of this committee, we all know the dire state of lack of adequate state resources and the serious consequences it has on our state's inability to service the legitimate, legitimate needs of our population, the majority of whom are, are desperately poor and whose living conditions have, bare, have barely deteriorated over the past few years to which the consequences of COVID-19 pandemic contributed significantly. We now all know the shameful fact that South Africa is the most unequal society in the world. This is a challenge. This is, this is a challenge that this committee faces on a daily basis as part of our responsibility to execute our oversight role and to protect our very limited state resources and ensure their proper and most effective utilization for public funds to be misused for party political purpose is not only a crime, it, it is also an unforgivable givable moral outrage. Jefferson, it is in this context that I took the very difficult decision to write to you and to request that President Ramaphosa should be summoned to appear before this committee. I did so as a member of parliament when, when I was sworn in, when I was sworn in, I made an oath of allegiance that, I quote, open quote, I, Mervyn Alexandra Dirks, swear that I will be faithful to the Republic of South Africa and will obey, respect, and uphold the Constitution and all other laws of, of the Republic. And I solemnly promise to perform my functions as a member of the National Assembly to the best of my ability, so help me God, close quote. Every MP who are members of this committee of SCOPA took a similar oath. Therefore, I find myself here amongst equals in this committee, who as public representatives now, who as public rep represent representatives, now that all of us are aware of the, of the very serious tantamount to criminal statements that the President of the Republic made have an inescapable duty to hold him accountable. As all of us know, no citizen is above the law, and that includes President Ramaphosa too. Honorable Chairperson, when I wrote a letter to you requesting that President Ramaphosa be summoned to appear before this committee, I fully understood the gravity of what I was doing. It was a conscious decision, Chairperson. It was a conscious decision. It was my decision and my decision alone as the member of parliament who has taken that out of office. I was fully aware of the terrible pressure that will be brought to bear on me by my own party, the African National Congress, to withdraw my letter. I must say that I hope, almost against hope, that the ANC and the ANC chief who, who took the same oath of allegiance that I have referred to as a public representative and who executes such measures through our ANC caucus would have behaved honorably and not fall 
or not fell, fall into the trap of being narrow and partisan uh, by attempting to become a Honorable Turks, I'm going to request you to confine yourself to the matter at hand that you have requested the committee to consider the request you have made for the committee to look into the matter, including but not limited to summoning the president of the republic on the basis of the audio clip. I must be very deliberate. The committee will not engage in party political matters. They are not our purview. And I fundamentally believe they may begin mudding the waters of this process. The issues related to yourself and the chief whip of your party are not matters of this committee. I appreciate if you could bear with us in that regard. And in as much as, and I must say, I appreciate the difficulty with which uh, this matter has brought to bear on yourself. I fully understand that. But at the same time, I must urge you to confine yourself to motivating for the request that you have made, which I have agreed with you is a matter which is very, very serious. So let us please not detour into spaces which are not the purview and competence um, of, of the committee. Okay, Chairperson, I accept it. Thank Let you. Me continue. Let me continue, Chairperson. Honorable Chairperson, having brought this matter in the official and public manner that I have done to the attention of all honorable members of this committee, this is no longer only my responsibility to ensure that it is acted on. All of you now also carry the inescapable responsibility and duty. Thus, I can do. Thus, I can do no other than to continue to insist that the president of the republic must be called to account for what he had said and this and this apparent criminal act of concealing or withholding information about the cri crime of mis misusing of public funds. Jefferson, coming to the details of my uh, presentation. You have availed to me the legal opinion of the Chief Parliamentary Legal Advisor, Advocate Z. Adizikari. Sorry if I spell your name wrong, uh, uh, Advocate. Concerning summoning the President before the committee, it is not my intention to respond in details to every paragraph of the legal opinion of the Parliamentary Legal Advisor. However, by not doing so, I want to emphasize that this must not be construed as me waiving any of my legal rights, which I certainly do not do. Suffice to say that the overall thrust of the legal opinion is that this committee occupies a unique role in the parliamentary structure and that the National Assembly and its committees has the general power to summons any person to appear before it or to produce documents. The last sentence in paragraph 10 of the legal opinion states, this SCOPA is an information gathering tool to facilitate and strengthen the executor execution of the mandate of parliament, including oversight over the executive and state organs of state. Furthermore, paragraph 24 states, if indeed public funds of any government department or public entity have been utilized for unauthorized purposes, SCOPA is mandated to further investigate and consider such matter. Of particular interest to SCOPA is whether and how the alleged unauthorized expenditure was captured in the financial statements and whether it was detected by the AG and if so, how they were reported. If they were not detected, it must be determined whether there was any conduct that constitutes misrepresentation by any official. This must be read together with the first sen sentence of paragraph 25 that makes the important point that in order to fulfill this oversight mandate, SCOPA will require further information to ascertain, to ascertain whether government departments or 
and entities may have channeled funds unlawfully for the purposes alluded to by the president in the audio clip. Ultimately, the, the legal opinion concludes that this committee can re resolve to call on the president to provide information on, the, on this matter, which is very important. President can be called to provide information on this matter because you're not an accused here. If, if we want to gather information, to, it can be called to, to provide information on this matter. And that, su and that such account must be for the purpose of and pursuant to maintaining oversight of the executive and organs of state in relation to expenditure and that the focus should be on what information the president has that can assist the committee to fulfill oversight, uh, its oversight mandate. So therefore, if there is nothing wrong to call the president to inquire from him what information does he have that can assist the committee about th this allegation of alleged uh, misabuse, corruption and of state funding, of st public funds for public, uh, for party political campaigning. The fact that the president Having knowledge about the misuse of public funds is definitely also in serious breach of the parliamentary ethics code. And this falls with the preview of the public protector. I have already addressed myself, addressed, I've already written and addressed a formal letter of complaint to the public protector. I will similarly also very soon address address the other serious concern that I have the, the two to the to the to Mr. Zondo, to Chief Just, Deputy Chief Justice Zondo. I have to address uh, a letter to to him regarding uh, regarding this matter since the president appeared before the Zondo Commission. What is relevant however uh, Chairperson, what is relevant for our purposes in this meeting of, of the, our committee today is that legally President Ramaphosa is required to provide further information and can be summoned to appear before this committee on the basis of the serious admissions that he had made in the state audio recording that he is aware of criminal misuse of state funds for party political purposes. Furthermore, that it is our duty to do so in order to fill fulfill our critical oversight mandate as the standing committee on public accounts, which ultimately, ultimately is our raison d'etre. Honorable Chairperson, to conclude, I therefore urge you as Chairperson of this committee, together with all other auditor members, no matter which party my, or any one of us belong to, to take our oversight mandate and duty very serious. We owe it to all South Africans that, that we democratically represent the majority of whom are poor and in dire need, that we will with diligence and integrity protect and defend the public purse. That mission of the president of the Republic in his own words, that he knows about misuse of public funds for party political purposes, and that, you, and that he would rather fall on, on his sword than to reveal this critical information it's, ex it's extremely uh, 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 serious. Indeed, even it's damning, it's damning this information. We cannot escape our duty as contained in the oath of allegiance that each one of us, each one of us formally laid down before our people and court to insist that all the relevant information must be brought before us and that ultimately it is not possible for President Ramaphosa to escape being summoned to explain his very own words. Jefferson, I thank you. Uh, as I have concluded my presentation to SCOPA, however, I have to raise one more issue. Uh, Jefferson, if this matter goes to a vote today, Jefferson, I have been looking out for the ATC uh, since last week. Uh, and you know that in order for a member, for a member not to be uh, to be removed from a committee, uh, it must be ATC. I have not been ATC. There's no ATC out. There's no ATC that has been published that are saying that I am not a member of this committee. Therefore, in terms of the law, 
as I respect the decision of the court today, that my matter is not urgent, and I respect and will abide by it, we all need to abide by the law and follow the rules and the laws and the procedures of parliament. I have re again this afternoon uh, looked at all the ATCs. I have the link. There's no ATC had have removed me from um, as being a member of this committee until such time that it has been ATC. I remain a member of this committee in good standing, and I will participate today in the voting process on this matter because. There is no ATC that have removed me from this member. And in terms of the uh, rules, regulations, and procedures of parliament, Chair, that we all must abide by, I am a member of this portfolio committee as things stand today. I thank you very much, Chairperson. All right. Um, thank you uh, very much, uh, Honorable Dirks, for um, your presentation. Um, and the very serious um, issues which um, you have raised. Um, it is um, obviously a very difficult subject matter, uh, but one which I fundamentally believe we are equal to as this committee and we will um, handle it in a manner which is correct. All right, what I'm going to do now, uh, colleagues, um, I've noted the last part of the the, the the presentation, I will deal with that um, shortly. Uh, but let me do this. Can I ask Parliament Legal uh, to now come in? Uh, because the vast array of complexities which arise out of this, amongst others, um, ones which we need to give particular attention to. And it was precisely because of the complexities of the issue that I uh, ask Parliament Legal on behalf of the committee, as we usually do. Um, and I appreciate, I must say, I appreciate the work that Parliament Legal has uh, done um, and continues to do in assisting us as a committee to perform um, our work. Um, I, 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 I think that uh, Parliament Legal is ready um, so we'll go to them and then colleagues, uh, you will indicate in our side office uh, when you uh, wish to speak as per normal, um, and then we'll take it um, from there. So Parliament Legal, um, over to you. And Honorable Dirks, I am going to make the assumption that you were reading uh, your presentation. I mean, I'll request that um, you transmit that uh, uh, presentation to our secretariat. Um, for the record, um, so that uh, we don't hope have it only as a recording, but that we also um, have it um, in writing. It may assist us uh, moving forward. All right, Parliament Legal, um, I record Fatim Ibrahim. Uh, may I hand over to you? Um, and thank you once again for being readily available um, for the work at hand. Over to you, ma'am. Um, thank you so much, Chair, and good afternoon to all of the members. Um, and staff um, on the platform today. Um, Chair, our office was requested to advise um, the committee on, on a very crisp question, being whether it can summons um, the president to answer allegations relating to the use of public funds for certain election campaigns in the lead up to the 2017 ANC elective um, conference. Um, but of course, um, Chair, as you know, lawyers never answer crisp um, questions concisely. So um, please forgive me if this is a little bit longer um, than expected. I will try and move um, move along quickly though. No, uh, um, Advocate, Advocate, please uh, don't feel the need for any rush. Uh, okay. Go with the issues as important as you believe that you should um, so that we are not found uh, wanting. So there's no pressure. Uh, feel, yeah, the, you've got that latitude. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, Chair, I'm not going to repeat too much of the background because I think that um, Mr. Dirks did go through that in quite a bit of detail, save um, for mentioning just two specific things that I'd like to emphasize. Um, the first is that um, it's our instructions that the letter is based only on the leaked portion of the audio and that there's no publicly available um, record of that meeting in its entirety. That's the first thing. The second thing is, we note in particular that the audio referred um, to alleged utilization of public money 
being used from the state security agency. So we do make specific mention of that particular entity um, in our opinion. Um, Chair, as members will be aware, the NA, um, in terms of the constitution, must provide mechanisms to ensure that all executive organs um, of state in the national sphere of government are accountable to it. It must maintain oversight um, of the exercise of national executive authority and the implementation of legislation. And as we know, this is mainly done um, through the establishment of committees to deal with either specific issues or, this, um, or the functioning of specific departments or entities. Um, in this regard, the um, NA establishes the Standing Committee on Public Accounts. And um, I think it's important, Chair, that we go through NA Rule 245.1, which sets out the mandate um, of SCOPA. It says that the Standing Committee on Public Accounts must consider the financial statements of all executive organs of state and constitutional institutions or other public bodies when those statements are submitted to Parliament, any audit reports issued on those statements, any reports issued by the AG on the affairs of any executive organ of state, constitutional institution or other public body, any reports reviewing expenditure of public funds by any executive organ of state and constitutional institution or other public body, and any other financial statements or reports referred to the committee in terms of these rules. Furthermore, the committee may then report on any of those financial statements or reports to the National Assembly. It may initiate any investigation in its area of competence, and it must perform any other functions, tasks, or duties assigned to it in terms of the constitution, legislation, the rules, the joint rules, or resolutions of the Assembly. Um, So, Chair, at this juncture, I just want to note that there is also other uh, means of oversight. Committees are just one of them. By way of example, um, for purposes of this particular matter, the NA can hold the President to account in accordance with NA Rules 140 and 145, which regulate the putting of questions to the President for oral or written reply, respectively. So it's not only via the mechanisms of committees that um, the oversight uh, function occurs. The general power to summons in terms of section 56A of the constitution laid together with the powers, privileges and immunities of Parliament and provincial legislatures act, the NA and any of its committees may summons any person to appear before it or to produce documents. Um, as um, Mr. Dirks indicated, this is an information gathering tool to facilitate and strengthen the execution of the mandate of Parliament, including oversight over the executive and organs of state. Um, so, Chair, this power enables committee to ex the committee to exercise its oversight function, even in cases where individuals or entities are otherwise reluctant to appear before the committee to answer any allegations or to otherwise provide information that a committee may require to fulfill its oversight functions. The power to summons, however, Chair, is not an unfettered power. In light of the principle of legality, Parliament may only summon persons for the purpose of performing its constitutional and statutory obligations, including holding them to account or maintaining oversight related to the performance of public functions in terms of law. Um, furthermore, each individual committee will therefore be further restricted to only summonsing those persons who may be able to answer questions or produce information related to that committee's particular mandate. And I indicated clearly earlier what the mandate of this particular committee is. Um, Chair, I just want to take you through the legal um, status of the State Security Agency, because I, as I said, um, that particular body was specifically mentioned in the audio. The State Security Agency is a creature of statute. It's established um, in terms of the Intelligence Services Act and is audited um, by the AG. At the moment, um, it falls under um, the leadership of the Minister in the Presidency, Mr. Bungobela. The Executive Members Ethics Act Chair, Section 96 of the Constitution states that members of the Cabinet and Deputy Members must act in accordance with the Code of Ethics prescribed by national legislation, and it also sets out the minimum ethical standards by which Cabinet Members and Deputy um, Ministers must abide. So this section, Chair, finds expression in the Executive Members Ethics Act of 1998, and in terms of that act, there is also what is called the Executive Ethics Code. Um, which is promulgated in terms of section 2.1. 
um, that chair is not, uh, section 2.1 rather, that chair is not to be confused with Parliament's own um, ethics code. Section 1 of the, the Ethics Act um, says that the code must promote an open, democratic and accountable government in terms of which all cabinet members and for purposes of, of that act, cabinet members includes the president, deputy ministers and MECs must perform the executive functions. And Chair, that code goes into um, some detail on the ethical obligations. It's not necessarily for purposes of this meeting for me to go through those. Um, but they also include provisions on conflicts of interest, financial disclosures, acceptance of gifts, and other general ethical um, standards. Section 3 of that Ethics Act mandates the public protector to um, investigate any alleged breach of the code on receipt of a, uh, of a complaint in respect thereof. So that oversight power in relation to that particular act does not reside with um, Parliament. Chair, uh, the audio recording upon which Mr. Dirk's complaint is based is limited, and we must note that it doesn't provide sufficient context to the discussion or the entirety of the um, president's remarks. Um, if I recall, it was it was about um, two minutes uh, long, Chair, and that is the only information that was uh, provided to us in order to prepare um, this opinion. Nonetheless, Chair, the audio seemingly um, implies that public funds were used for party campaign purposes leading up to the NASRAQ conference. And in particular, it appears that reference is being made to funds being channeled from the State Security Agency um, for this purpose. Now, Chair, as I mentioned earlier, as part of its mandates, COPA is responsible for the oversight of financial expenditure of public funds through engaging with and interrogating financial statements, um, audit and other expenditure reports um, of organs of state. Um, and Scopa does this and one would assume that if there are allegations that um, such funds were used from, from public entities or from government departments that at some time Scopa would have been appraised with those financial statements and that is where it finds um, relevance uh, for us today. So if indeed public funds um, have been utilized for unauthorized purposes, and, and here when I say unauthorized, uh, I, I mean unauthorized in terms of section one of the PFMA, which defines unauthorized expenditure as expenditure that isn't in accordance with the purpose of a vote, or in the case of a main division, not in accordance with the purpose of the main division. And chair members are well aware of the fact that accounting officers who fail to prevent unauthorized expenditure or losses um, from criminal conduct or guilty of financial misconduct, and that in itself constitutes a criminal offence in terms of Section 86 um, of the PFMA. So of particular interest to Scopa now is whether and how this alleged um, unauthorised expenditure was captured in the financial statements, whether it was detected by the AG, and if so, how it was reported. Um, if it wasn't detected, then it must be determined whether there was any conduct that constitutes misrepresentation by any official, and also to see where the gaps were that um, allowed for this to go undetected, uh, notwithstanding um, all of the oversight measures that take place. Um, in order to fulfill this oversight mandate, SCOPA will obviously require further, further information to ascertain which government departments or entities may have channeled funds unlawfully for the purposes allegedly alluded to uh, by the president in the audio clip. And this information will assist Scopa to now narrow its inquiry into the matter and call for such further evidence as may be necessary to exercise its specific oversight function. In this way, Chair, once um, Scopa knows which departments uh, may possibly be implicated or which inter public entities may be implicated, Scopa can then determine um, who should be called to account. So the relevant accounting officers and ministers um, in order that they provide further clarity on whether there was in fact unauthorized expenditure uh, and if so, whether any action is taken against any persons who may have been complicit um, in such conduct. As such, Chair, um, the President may be requested to provide information, including records on any relevant issue. And when I say relevant here, Chair, I mean relevant um, to um, the, the functions of SCOPA particularly. And that would be information that the president may have which relates to the alleged misuse of public funds for the purposes of election campaigns. 
information relating to whether there were any instructions to any minister, accounting officer, or any other officials to release such funds or to facilitate the release of such funds, and if so, where such instructions um, emanate from. Furthermore, whether the relevant ministers or accounting officers were made aware of any unauthorized spending in the event that such instructions to channel funds were done by uh, other officials uh, within their departments, whether there are any records of what such unauthorized funds may have been utilized for and how they were captured in those financial statements and um, reports, and whether any other members of parliament or officials of any organ of state may have further relevant information. And also then, Chair, there was, um, the President alluded to certain contracts in that um, audio clip. So whether there's any information on contracts for goods and services and payment, therefore, um, for party campaigning purposes, so that SCOPA can attempt to trace um, these back to the financial statements. After consideration of um, information tabled before it, SCOPA can then determine whether any further recommendations or investigations are required. As I said, SCOPA may um, choose to initiate its own um, processes. Um, otherwise, it may refer a matter to the walks for investigation where criminal conduct is suspected on the part of any persons or to the public protector in respect of a possible breach of ethical conduct. But of course, Chair, at the moment, we're not seized with sufficient information um, to determine what our future uh, conduct would be. In the event that SCOPA does resolve to call the president to provide information on the matter, such account must be limited for the purpose of and pursuant to maintaining oversight of the executive and organs of state in relation to expenditure. In other words, it is not the role of SCOPA to deal with any alleged ethical breaches of the president, even though these, if apparent, are closely connected to any inquiry into the matter. And that, that chair is quite important because as I said, um, SCOPA's mandate does not extend to those issues. The breach of the ethics code falls within the purview of the public protector who is responsible for making such a determination. The focus, therefore, must be very limited and be particularly on what information the president has on the matter that can assist SCOPA in fulfilling its oversight mandate. It is not the mandate of SCOPA to consider the conduct of the president or whether there has been a failure um, of the president to share information with the Zondo Commission as alleged. SCOPA may accordingly use its constitutional powers to summon any person, and this would include the president, to provide further information on any allegations that relate to the mandate of SCOPA. For purposes of this audio clip, it may, for example, include the Minister of the Department of State Security, the Director General of that department, and other relevant um, officials. And again, I mentioned them because there was specific mention um, of that particular entity in the tape. It must be added that the Joint Standing Committee Chair on Intelligence has a specific mandate to look into the accounts of the State Security Agency as provided for in Section 3 of the Intelligence Services Oversight Act. Um, and historically, it is that committee that looks at um, those financial statements. That being said, there is nothing that prohibits um, scope from considering um, same. However, Chair, notwithstanding Scopus' power to summons any person, we advise that summons be used um, as a last resort, um, and only in the event that an individual refuses to comply with a reasonable request to appear before the committee. Um, in other words, the interest of cooperative, in the interest of cooperative governments, a summons should be used conservatively and attempts to secure the presence of required individuals should be by invitation um, wherever possible. Um, Chair, this is consistent with our advice um, to the committee um, in, in any single um, question that has been presented to us in terms of summonsing any person. Um, in, in this case, the president has not indicated that he's unwilling to attend or unwilling to provide um, information. Therefore, summons should really be um, a last resort. Furthermore, Chair, I think consideration must also be had to whether um, the information is required orally or whether the president can be requested to respond um, in writing uh, to any questions that the that the committee may have. Um, Chair, that is all from our side, unless members have um, any questions. But I, I, Chair, if you will indulge me, 
um, to please ask um, Advocate um, Jenkins whether he wishes to add anything to what I've already said. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, um, Advocate Abraham, um, for that very thorough, um, you know, presentation of the legal um, opinion. Um, I will go to Advocate Jenkins uh, now, and then colleagues, I will come to you. Advocate Jenkins, anything on your side? Uh, Chairperson, nothing to add from my side. Thank you very much to my colleague and to the committee. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Right. Um, I just want to uh, also bring to the attention of the committee um, that uh, yesterday we received a request from the State Security Agency to provide the documentation for this meeting for the purposes of them being prepared for this meeting. And I want to categorically uh, state that we are not at that stage where we, will, we are interacting with the SSA or any person who affected in any way on this matter until the committee has made a determination. So in the event that um, the SSA is present here today, it will be solely for the purposes of them um, listening in um, on what we are discussing. So I just, so that there's no expectation then they, that um, they've got a comment uh, to make or an input to make um, that would fundamentally be amounting to putting the cart before the horse before the committee has concluded on a logical sequence um, of how it wants to um, handle this matter. So um, that did somewhat surprise me. All right. Um, Honorable Hadebe, um, and then Honorable Lis, and then Honorable Mende, in that order, please. Oh, I with an H, yes. Nyabongasalo, um, for the sake of securing stability on my network, please allow me not to switch on my okay. video. I'm so sure by you. now you all know me. Yeah, no, that's fine. Uh, you may proceed, that's understandable. But thank you, Honorable Sengwa, uh, the chairperson of SCOPA. Honorable members, colleagues, comrades, and compatriots, uh, compliments of the new year. Indeed, Honorable Chairperson, uh, this afternoon, just like any other meetings of SCOPA, were called upon to attend to a very important matter. We're here to ensure that all executive organs of state are accountable to the National Assembly through the Standing Committee on Public Accounts. Honorable Chairperson, fellow South Africans, I want to assure you that as SCOPA, we are going to continue to exercise our rights, perform our duties, roles, and responsibilities. And in executing our mandate, we will do so without any fear or favor. As SCOPA, we are not in business of protecting anyone, regardless of the position you hold. However, we will do so in line with our constitution, Act 108 of 96, including adherence to the rules of the National Assembly and all other mechanisms at our disposal to ensure accountability. Therefore, fellow South Africans, there must be no doubt, confusion, or uncertainty when it comes to that aspect of our mandate. So, Salo Mandiengo, Apokfele Konitole, Mangaulen Wahuka. And and this old woman born and a macassi dear son. Yes, Zulu, any Kazugu from Sonishwa, Uguti, the Shoshela, a Shashalazi. But before I do that, it must be clear, Chair, that today we are here to afford Honorable Dax an opportunity to address us, of which he did, in order for us as a committee to be able to make an informed decision on the way forward. Now, fellow South Africans, indeed, any allegation of misuse of public funds, those allegations we take them seriously and they deserve the attention of the committee. However, at this stage, we are not dealing with the merits and demerits of these allegations as they relate to misuse of public funds. 
This is indeed in line, as you have pointed out, Chair, with our established practice as a committee. Now, having read and listened to the correspondences and honorable desk respectively, including, of course, the legal opinion from the chief parliamentary legal advisor. Indeed, Chair, as correctly stated in the legal opinion, the letter is based only on the leak portion of an audio that there are no publicly available records of the meeting in its entirety. I also concur with the legal opinion that Mr. Dark's complaint is based on limited and does not provide sufficient context to the discussion or the entirety of the president's remark. Now, of course, our mandate as SCOPA, we are responsible for the oversight of the financial expenditure of public funds. As the legal opinion has clearly stated, honorable chairperson and fellow South Africans, it is not the role of SCOPA to deal with any alleged ethical breach. It is not the mandate of SCOPA to consider conduct of the president, including information shared or not shared with the Zondo Commission as alleged in the complainant's letter. Honorable Chairperson, the above are some of the extract from the Chief Parliamentary Legal Advice. And it further continues to say on general powers to someone, the advice, the advice given before us is that in terms of section 56, subsection A, of the constitution read together with powers, privilege, and immunities of parliament act number four of 2004. The advice says each individual committee is further restricted to summoning those persons who may be able to answer questions or produce information related to that of the committees particular mandate. Honorable Chairperson, in this regard, the National Assembly holds the President of the Republic to account in accordance with the National Assembly rules, section 140 and section 145, which regulates putting of questions to the President for oral or written reply. Sitting here, I don't recall any instance situation where the president has failed or vehemently refused to answer question in parliament. At this current juncture and at this stage, and having listened to honorable texts, there is no justification whatsoever that warrants scope to resort to summoning someone, none whatsoever. This view is supported by the legal opinion, which reads, and I quote, notwithstanding Scopa's power to summon any person, we advise that someone be used as a last resort in an event that an individual refused to comply with a reasonable request to appear before the committee. In the interest of cooperative governance, a someone should be used conservatively. I repeat, at no stage, under no circumstances, I've witnessed an, a situation where His Excellency President Cyril Ramaphosa refused to answer to question before Parliament. Honorable Chairperson, honorable members and fellow South Africans. At this current juncture, it will be highly irrational, unreasonable and unjustifiable for Scopa to even consider summoning the president. The issue of someone does not arise at this stage. No evidence or basis for Scopa to summon the president. Let us be guided by principle of natural justice 
which put emphasis on procedural fairness, which tries to ensure that a fair decision is reached. Honorable Chairperson, fellow South African, maintaining procedural fairness protects the rights of individual and enhances public confidence in the process, including all the Altaram Patem rule. We cannot at this stage think about forcing or ordering the president to appear before Scopa as if he has refused to cooperate with Scopa. I, Becky Hadebe, with an H, as a whip, I therefore move that the committee should first write to the president, alert him of these allegations and then request the president of the country to provide the committee with a written response. Once that is done, allow SCOPA sufficient time to process the response, which will be in writing from the president and based on the 10 responses, we will then determine our next cause of action. Like we have done with Honorable Holomisa versus DBSA, ESCOM, Chief Procurement Officer's letter, all other hearings, be it VBS, uh, municipalities that are in this array, we have embarked on this procedural fairness. We are all interested in dealing decisively with this matter expeditiously, as soon as relevant information is before us. Let me sub Marine. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Hatev. Uh, Mam Machau, I have noted you have added you to um, the list. Um, and Mam Dolash, um, I see that you didn't indicate in the side office, but I've noted you um, on my list. All right, uh, Honorable Liz, let me hand over to you. Honorable Hatev, thank you much. May I, uh, you've made a proposal. May I hold that proposal in abeyance so that we can get um, the views of the committee. I will put that proposal um, to the committee once we have heard everyone. So I've noted that I mean that in what you have said so that it doesn't get lost um, in the course of the discussion. Right, Babulis, over to you. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, yeah, it's a new year and good to be back. I'm sorry the start of our year is such as it is. Mr. Chairman, the, the leaked recording um, went public some time ago and it caused considerable angst, I think, throughout South African society. South African society um, is faced with a ongoing pandemic of state corruption and the Zondo Commission is coming to an end and has certainly highlighted that. The unauthorized use of state funding um, has been going on for a very long time and, and I believe continues as we speak. And the fact that there is a recording which seems to indicate that the president of our country has knowledge, if not has participated in such unauthorized expenditure of state funds is extremely concerning. In fact, it's really very, very serious. And we, we have to deal with it in some way or another um, in order to ensure that we are all serious about dealing with the corruption that is endemic in our society today. So the question really is now how one goes forward. And I had just sent you a draft resolution, um, which I would like us to consider. And to some extent, it fits in with what Becky is saying as well. Um, but let me say this, Mr. Chairman, 
If I were President Ramaphosa, and the chances of that being the case are less than zero, but if I were, I would think that President Ramaphosa would actually volunteer to deal with this matter transparently and openly and be willing to come and address this committee and say, these are the facts, this is the position, and to ensure that the presidency of the Republic of South Africa is not tainted with the same corruption brush that taints so many of our politicians, which some of whom apparently remain in parliament as we speak, but have not been referred to this committee. So, Mr. Chairman, whilst I have a draft resolution that I would like the committee to consider, because I don't think this is a matter that can simply be swept away, um, it doesn't preclude at a, some stage a, a summoning. However, I would really urge President Ramaphosa and his advisors, if they're listening, to take this opportunity to voluntarily come forward and ensure that he appears before this committee to enable us to ask questions. Because in the end, we all know what happens with parliamentary written questions. But even worse is parliamentary oral questions. They simply don't get replies. They get obfuscation at every turn. I am not aware of a single minister of government in my 13 years in parliament who has ever fully and transparently replied to written questions I have submitted. And that situation has actually got worse in this sixth parliament. And therefore, I say to you, Mr. Chairman, that whilst I would draft and recommend to the committee that we start with asking President Ramaphosa for a full written explanation, and I would go further and say within seven days, this matter has been going on for over a month, and I'm sure President Ramaphosa and his legal advisors have considered this matter very carefully and don't need a lot of time. Um, I would still say that that would be the first step in a process. So, Mr. Chairman, um, the draft resolution that I emailed to you about 15 minutes ago, I would like to amend that slightly and add in a time frame of seven days for a written response. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Okay, um, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Lise. Um, the Secretariat, um, please just um, get that draft resolution so we can circulate it to uh, members and so that it adds part of the proposals that are in there. Um, and then we will take it forward there. So thank you very much, Honorable Lise, um, for that. Um, Honorable Manta, over to you. Thank you very much, Chair. And, uh... Happy New Year to everyone. Chair, I just want to deal with uh, only four matters, just only four. One, the issue of um, a question or a letter to be sent to the president to explain or we write him a question to explain does not arise. This is not the matter which um, he has to, uh, let me put it this way, account on, let's say, if this was a matter of water and we're calling the minister of water and then we say water, answer this is the question and obviously Mazambane have uh, already indicated this that questions are not answered and that's actually not our mandate 
But in fact, not our mandate. It's every member can do that of questions. Us, we are scorpa. We are policing the public funds. As and when we become aware or alerted to misappropriation of funds, that's it's our duty to ensure that we guard jealously the public purse. Now, number two, is a clear indication of the public funds which the president on the recording is referring to. Let me now take you, uh, let me now take you a uh, committee to the document we just received, which is an opinion, a legal opinion. It's referring us firstly to who is responsible for looking after the budget of SSA as one of the areas um, that have been indicated or disclosed on the tape as an area of easy target in terms of taking money for something else which is not meant to be. And of course, the scoper is allowed to go into that space. But let me just highlight something for everyone, which I think everyone does not have um, the privilege to know. However, if you would remember, during a budget mini plenaries, not only one party, I think about two, if not three parties, raised a concern where SSA was concerned about the management of the slash fund and how they do not have, they absolutely have no oversight over the slash fund. And thus, Parliament had to do something, was called upon to do something. We can't have that kind of money in the country unaccounted for, but being utilized for things we do not know. One of these questions and one of these debates arose, I was, arose from um, the Guiani era when Guiani schools were burned down. And we asked, where is the SSA when the Guiani schools are being bent on a daily basis, on the basis of service delivery? So where is this money that is all, always allegedly being spent on spies to ensure that our facilities and anyone who's coercing society into destroying our public facilities is caught before they can advance. There was no answer. So I think the legal opinion needs another legal opinion because there is a huge part of money at SSA that is not policed by no one. And then it leaves a room. And in the recording, it's very clear that one, some of the areas that the money comes from is SSA. And it makes it, it it's, it's no um, gray area of, some, of any sort that it's easy to get the hands into the cookie jar of the SSA slash fund, take that money and use it for anything, which is a public money when all other departments are suffering and get their budgets cut, we spend money into the slush fund, which the, Afri the South Africans do not know what it does. So the legal opinion cannot tell us that there is people policing the money, the SSA. there's no people policing the money, the SSA, including SCOPA. 
They must get their facts right as well. Then, it then requires us as COPA to get into the space. Because if there's SSA money alleged to be spent into party politics, besides the allocations that the legislation allows to political parties, we ought to know. That's the money that must go to the people. That's the money that must go and build schools. We ought to know that. So we cannot be told by a legal opinion that no, someone is doing, there's no one doing anything anyway. We've been to this parliament the, the entire past five years. Now we are on the third year of the new administration. Now, the third area I want to address, Chair, is yes, the public protector in terms of her mandate. She deals with the ethical conduct of cabinet, executive, and the president. Yeah, no, no that's fine. We're not looking for the ethical conduct of the president. We are looking for information from the president that he knows. We are affording him an opportunity to say what that you said in your meeting, come and say it to us because we've been looking for culprits. ESCOM is dead. Transnet is dying. SA Express is dead. Um, SAA is dying. Danelle is dead. So if the president knows something and help us, because we've been dealing with AG reports and every other report, and within our mandate, anyone who can assist us with the information to get to the bottom of who is the culprit, who is opening the purse from the bottom so that it just flows without the people who are guarding the purse seeing it, he must come and tell us. We're not looking into his ethical code. We're not looking into his conduct, at least not now. For now, we're affording him an opportunity to come and tell us that which he said in his party meeting. That's what we want to do. And therefore, he must come and say that. That's uh, the area number three. And then the fourth area I want to address, Chair, is the area of what must be done. The president must come to the committee. We are affording him an opportunity to come and explain that which he said on the tape to South Africans, that as a president of the ANC, I am aware in the ANC of the people who gets their hands into the cookie jar, take South Africans' money, use it for party politics to contest me, to contest whoever, and then win or not win. That's what we want to know. And we all know how things spend out in the Zondo Commission, which the president went as well. It was clear how the slush fund was spent. And it was clear how it's easy to get money from the slush fund. It becomes an easy target and anyone else can get access to it. And I've explained to everyone here, how is it that it's so possible and it's so easy to get the hands into the slush fund because no one else looks after it. Uh, I am submarine there, Chair, for now. Thank you very much. You and Honorable Hatebe in this submarining term are reminding me of my days in student politics. Um, all right, no, I've noted You're going too much room soon. You're going too much <laughs> I, room. I know, that's the next one. Eh? <laughs> all right, uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Mente. Right, uh, Honorable Machau, I'll come to you, Honorable Tolashe, um, and then Honorable Somu, you will be the last one, and then, oh, and oh, Honorable Fanminen, um, and then we will be able then to um, take decisions uh, and take this matter forward. Right, Mam Machau, good to see you, over to you. And uh, thank you very much. Chairperson and compliments of the new year to all the members present here. Chairperson, I would like to concur with the previous speaker, that is Honorable Liz and Honorable Mente, that we have a constitutional and statutory object, obligation as a scoper. We have to guard against the misuse 
of the public funds. My point now is to, for us, to fast track the whole process is to invite, I fully support the previous speakers, the president to come to Scopa and we interact directly with him and try to, to find out all the gray areas that we'd like uh, to find out from him. Because writing a letter, it will be letters after letters. You know, the, the most problematic thing is that the letter cannot explain itself. If, if maybe he can respond by writing, writing cannot explain itself. But by inviting him, we'll be able to find out everything that we would like to get from the president. So I fully support that. As COPA, let us invite the president and within maybe seven days, as suggested by an honorable list, so that we directly interacted with him to resolve the matter once and for, and for all. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Right. Thank you very much, Emma Makao, and compliments of the new year to you too. All right, Mam Dolasha, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Honorable Chairperson. A good afternoon to you, Honorable Members, and the people who are in attendance of this meeting. Indeed, I really would want to wish everybody here, Chair, to you uh, compliments of the season. Chair, once again, as Scopa, we must really give ourselves a pet in the back that we will display on our behalf a lot of agility in making sure that we honor the oath that we took, but we also exercise what we are here for. And Chair, I really would want to really say to Scopa, I guess for me, we are on it. We are on it, Chair, because this is not the first time when this matter of this kind has been brought to our attention and by very important people. In fact, one of our colleagues, as Honorable Beggy said earlier on, we had this kind of, 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 of an arrangement or of a, a member committed to the Constitution of the Republic. When Honorable Omisa came to come and present, he he what he 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 had at the time and Scopa needed to come in and really play its constitutional role to make sure that what were the gray areas insofar as Honorable Misa at the time became clearer. And Chair, we did that diligently. That matter it was brought before us, we dealt with it, and it is no matter now that we can say we haven't been able to. It's one matter that we must be proud of and say, indeed, regardless of the circumstances, SCOPA is still very committed in making sure that we respect the oath and we do what we are here for and we really respect the people of the Republic. I don't think SCOPA should be emotional about this, Chair. should not be emotional about this. We've been there. I guess we have to shed this. So let, let, let's take it as it comes. Also, I appreciate uh, Comrade Delks, uh, my honorable member, for this, that he, he thought it's important for him to bring this matter before us. And indeed, it is before us now, we are dealing with it. As we are dealing with it, like we did earlier on, we should. So that, Chair, we, we are very clear and meticulous in dealing with the matter that I agree with Honorable Police is quite important. The South African people would want to hear how do we deal with the matter. And we are going to deal with the matter as we are doing now. We are operating from the Constitution of the Republic and all other important documents that makes us to be able to get what's supposed to be the bottom line of matters. And this time, Chair, we also have parliamentary arrangements. And again, you did not hesitate to bring that to the fore 
and in this case, the legal advice, like you always do. Very clear legal advice that explains to us what is supposed to be done. And indeed, Chair, that's what we're going to do because anything outside that will not be able to achieve what we want to achieve, how the peace of the Republic is being safeguarded or are there people who are taking from the back? And if that is the case, a scorper, we need to make sure that we, we, we bring that to a drastic stop. I want Che to concur with the member, uh, Honorable Peggy, a very clear and outlined kind of an approach that we must follow. So that Che, we don't cut corners. We need not to cut corners. We are here, Che. We are going to deal with the matter. We must deal with the matter without being emotional. We must deal with the matter without being vindictive. We must deal with the matter with the facts before us and we must give ourselves time. Not perceptions that exist elsewhere, not the gossip that exists somewhere, but the facts before us as it is the case now. There's, there's a matter before us brought by honorable decks. There's a legal advice. We are here to discuss. There's a, a, a precedence and experience here. So what honorable Peggy outlined is there is exactly what we must do here, Chair. And, and, and really give an opportunity to whoever who is alleged to, 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 to get that opportunity to, 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 to respond. As we are not a court of law and we should not create that impression because we are not. We should remain a, this dedicated scoper that is very clear of its responsibility and do that in a meticulous and professional way. All other things should be put aside and deal with the actual that is in front of us and with what we are being advised by the most relevant and reliable people in our midst and make sure that we get to the bottom of this thing. As Honorable Peggy, for me, uh, raised his matter, I, I am with him. It will be difficult, Chair, if even before we discuss the matter, honorable members bring in their own resolution or their own. Why must we come to meetings then if I sit at home and, and bring a resolution for it to be adopted? I don't think it's fair, Chair. Let's give each other time, space, discuss the matter, and we resolve. We will resolve, as I am saying now, Chair. I second what Onam Peggy uh, Hadebe is saying. And for me, it is in line with all the guiding documents and the experience that we have. It will take us where we'd want to go, where we'd want to make sure that we know what transpired. We know what, what so that in future we avoid anything of that kind. If there's anything that had happened, Chair, we know what to do as COPA. We are very, very clear as this sixth parliament, Chair, we don't beat about the bush when there is an alleged corruption. We deal with it head on should not be worried about, uh, we must call some people tomorrow, whilst we know for a fact that we'll be crashing our own rules. I don't think we should do so, Chair. I think what Honorable Peggy is saying is correct for me. Let's follow that and, and make sure that we, we, we get to the bottom of this by making sure that we are very, very honest, but we're also very fair in dealing with this matter, both to the President of the Republic and anyone else who might be implicated. Because as I listen, there might, if you can get into this, there might be many people who, 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 who is implicated in this. And we need to hear from those people so that we really get to the bottom of this and conclude on the matter and give a clear guidance on what should happen going forward. Honorable Chairperson, that will be my take insofar as this matter is concerned. Thank you very much. Okay, no, thank you very much, Mam um, Tolasha. I think the draft resolution was a proposal being thrown in the basket of suggestions, which are like the proposal that Honorable Hatebe has made, and I would request we take it in that uh, in that in that spirit. 
uh, right, Honorable Van Minen and Honorable Somio, I think, yeah, you'll be the last one on this and then we'll come back uh, to the proposals. Thank you. Can you hear me, Chair? Yes, we can. Proceed. Okay, thanks. So we because I'm using my earphones. Thank you. Um, right, all right. I want to greet everyone and, and say Happy New Year. I must commend the Honourable Dirks for being brave enough to bring this to Scope. Scope is the organisation in Parliament that is tasked with dealing with uh, issues of public bodies in this kind of context. I have read the legal uh, opinion very carefully, and I see no reason why Scope should be limited at all in doing its part. In fact, I think that as members of SCOPA, we would in fact be remiss in terms of our duty as parliamentarians and our oath that we did not in fact investigate this. I think it is very, very important to understand that in a democracy, everybody is equal. We need to hold people to account. It is the job of SCOPA and of the parliament to hold the executive to account. In a case like this, where we certainly have indications of uh, public money is being misspent in, in various factors, and I'm not pointing fingers at any particular individuals, but certainly it would appear that there is knowledge of a political party misspending public monies. It is something we should rigorously be prepared to investigate, and I think it is something we should certainly take up. And in that way, I really want to agree with the, the Honourable Lise and the Honourable Mentor. Uh, I think if we do take the decision, and I think it would be, in fact, the only decision that is correct to inquire into this. We must certainly, if we do not at this particular meeting, take the decision to invite the president to come and uh, certainly um, reveal what he is aware of to SCOPA, we will certainly take the, the decision that we reserve our right to do so in the event that the answers he does provide are not sufficient. I think it is incredibly important that without fear or favour, we continue to actually do our jobs as MPs representing the people of South Africa, and it would certainly appear it is the people's money here that has been misspent in a political direction. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Fanminen, um, for that. Um, Honorable Somio. Well, well uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Honorable, Honorable Chair. Um, let, let's appreciate the the fact that the matter has been uh, tabled for us to have a consideration in terms of the process, uh, which uh, in the first instance, uh, even the honorable member who has taken this to us has a reference uh, to a known procedure uh, when such matters do arise. So it's a matter which is uh, somewhat acceptable uh, to everybody, including himself. For consistency, I think uh, they, they set uh, a procedure which uh, were followed over time, seeks to justify uh, some form of consistency uh, in dealing with matters and uh, entrench a form of uh, predictability in handling matters uh, of any kind uh, as the committee. It is so vital that there is no time uh, to circumvent such a set procedure uh, because through such an act, we might land into setting some form of a precedence which might not desirably land into a form which is going to take us to justice and uh, to achieve. Uh, in a way, uh, a standard which has been set internationally that at times it is so prudent to hear the other side. So in this, uh, in this view, uh, I, I think as uh, members of SCOPA, the set procedure should be followed and we should stick to it. We can't because it's a president and find it it suits us to circumvent as such a set a procedure. Um, equality at all times should be expressed and practiced. Even in this matter, we must be seen uh, that uh, we take through and follow the measures quite appropriately. 
because the standard of quality of our own debates rests uh, on the fact of clarity that we provide in handling each and every matter as the committee. We can't uh, today uh, seek to uh, divert to uh, a different route uh, to what you used to. So, so in, this, in this instance, I think we need to stick to the known uh, procedure that we write to an individual affected. And in this matter brought forward, the president is an affected uh, uh, a person and, and therefore he must be afforded uh, that right through a set uh, a practice. And, and uh, where I'm happy uh, is that it's not only us uh, as we deliberate on the matter. It, it, it as well has occupied uh, some form of reasoning, even on the honorable member, uh, uh, MP Dirk, who has brought the matter to us, that he is himself comfortable with the fact that all such set procedures must be, must be followed. Nothing uh, at this instance arises to confirm that a certain amount has gone uh, missing in this way, misappropriated in this way, but we must find out that kind of a, de a detail. In an intricate form, we should be allowed to delve on such information, but the starting point is what Honorable Hadebe has outlined, something which I think uh, we must appreciate because it does not fall away uh, from what we use, uh, used to do. So I want to appreciate the fact that Honorable Chairperson, in your receipt of such correspondence, you found it fit to sort advice and that advice we received and we have studied it. It is absolutely not far away from what we ordinarily find ourselves doing at all times. So let's get there to affirm our point of constitutionality uh, of these instances we attend to and our practice uh, in terms of the process as we seek to affirm the system uh, in terms of the parameters we'd want to reach on such a, on such a matter. So, so, so uh, we, we, we don't have to uh, seek any other emotive instances which would uh, seek us to do uh, something different uh, from such. So, so I, would, I would agree uh, with what is in front of us, which are even honorable list uh, is getting into in terms of the written proposition uh, in agreement with what Honorable Hadebe has dealt with uh, quite extensively uh, as a first speaker in this meeting. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chair. All right, colleagues, let me thank you um, very much um, for the very constructive um, input that you have made on this matter. Um, I will, uh, for all intents and purposes, resist the temptation as chair to be player and referee uh, in order to ensure the integrity of this process. However, I must point out that the matter is of a serious nature and that we must, as a committee, subject this matter to a process, a process which for all intents and purposes is consistent with the established and agreed practices of this party, including but not limited to the realities of the Audi Alter and Party Mill. We are duty bound as the committee to look into matters which have got a direct bearing on the public purse, appreciating that it is at times through accident or coincidence that we will stumble upon information or pointers to the direction towards what it is that we must push back against. 
The pandemic of corruption in South Africa requires all of us in our areas of deployment in the three spheres of the state, three arms of the state, to ensure that we are honest to our oaths of office. Having said that, if no one is above the law, then no one must be above our processes. And therefore we must ensure that we do not compromise what we seek to do with the hurried pace of politicking. I fundamentally believe that the president owes this committee, parliament, and the people of South Africa, an explanation and to take the country into his confidence about what he knows and doesn't know because something now, even if it's in the form of a clip of just over two minutes, has come to the fore which sits squarely on the desk of the president. And ours as this committee is to create a conducive and enabling environment for the president to do that, to ensure that we exercise our role of oversight and to hold the executive accountable, including the president. It would be a dereliction of duty if we do not do that. But we must do that consistent with our own practices so that we as a committee are never ever found wanting, nor found compromised, nor find politicking. We are the one committee in parliament which must rise above the divides and dictates of politics. The rest can play their politics. Here, it's ultimately about the money. And the president has got information which we require. We are settled with an escalating irregular fruitless and wasteful expenditure across the public space in all three spheres of government. We are settled with law enforcement agencies that are not moving with the necessary speed and agency to prosecute. And the number one citizen of our country, we now know has got information which we need in order to push back on the frontiers of corruption. Before we engage the the proposals, I must procedurally now colleagues, a deal with the request of Mr. Dex. Mr. Dex's request is that the president must be summoned. The committee must now pronounce itself on that. And I'm advised that in order for a summons to be triggered, the matter is not by agreement, but it must go to a vote. So um, as we recall, we have ex engaged in this exercise before. On top of that, I did indicate that Mr. Dirks uh, had raised an issue at the end of his submission, uh, which was speaking to his voting rights. I have been advised in that I did receive correspondence from his party indicating changes of membership to the committee. Accordingly, his party has also written to the speaker and I am told that the speaker has um, signed off on those uh, uh, changes and that the announcements, tablings and committees scheduled the ATC 
is a formality of process. So as things stand now, I have been advised that the um, ANC has effected changes in this format. Mr. Dirks has been discharged as a member of the Standing Committee on Public Accounts, and he has been replaced by the Honorable A. Bukas. And that the whip is now the Honorable B. Hadeb. So that is uh, where that matter stands. Um, and so I, 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 that's why I said I'll come back to that matter, but I've been advised and informed as such. And therefore, accordingly, um, that is the situation. So um, colleagues, the issue, and then I'll come to the proposals, but I think it's correct that we dispense with the issue of the summons, particularly because I was picking up that there's different um, uh, views on the table um, and that um, so that when we're moving forward, then we can look at whatever decision we take, we then look at the structure of that. And um, before doing that, I'd like to thank Mr. Dirks for his correspondence and for bringing this matter to our attention and for raising with raising it with the committee and appreciate the presentation that um, he has made. Um, and I believe that um, it was the right thing to do. And as a committee, we will view it through no other lens other than the lens of the rules. Um, because I fundamentally believe that is our primary responsibility. So I would like to thank Mr. Dirk in that regard. I see he's got his hand up and then colleagues will come to, um, to, to the issue of the summit. Honorable Dirks. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Chairperson. Uh, Chairperson, firstly, let me just thank you for uh, yes, allowing me yes. to in, in attending to some of these issues. Right. Can I ask them? Um, tonight is the Eastern Cape Copter MEC painting more to stop. Come out of the story. Newsroom Africa. Uh, um, can uh, host, can we ensure that if we, we, we mute um, people who are not recognized to speak? Um, all right. Uh, Honorable Dex, over to you. Sorry about that interruption. Yeah, uh, the, thank, thank you, Chairperson and members. Uh, I really appreciate, Chairperson, that you have given me the opportunity uh, for coming to do a presentation uh, today. Uh, no matter what decision or outcome uh, the committee will uh, embark on, I really appreciate the time that you have given me to actually do a presentation of the committee. Uh, let me further just stress this the rest here today that uh, I simply have no regrets for writing that letter to you, Chair. And if I can do it over again, I'll do it again, Chairperson. Um, so I have simply no regrets, Chairperson. It was my decision, Chairperson. Uh, I was fully aware of the consequences for writing such a letter. Um, I was fully aware that the objections I will receive from my, from my party, because some people only pay lip service to... Uh, to, to over, yeah. over side. So right. Thank you very much, Chair. All right, all right. All right. Order, 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 order. Dirks, uh, let us not um, muddy the waters. I think you, your presentation has been well received uh, by the committees, and there's agreement in large part. Um, in fact, there's agreement on the seriousness of the matter. The only points of divergence really as far as I see them are just about how we take the matter forward. So don't um, uh, uh, don't suffocate it at the end. Uh, all right, colleagues, may I now go to the question of the summons? Um, because well, they're not a chairperson's prerogative, they're a committee a prerogative. And so I'm going to um, put this matter now to a vote. Um, the Secretariat will note. All right, Honorable Mende, I see you, you've indicated you'd like to have a comment. Honorable Hattebe, okay, no. All right, Honorable Mende. 
Thank you, Chair. My network is not so good. I don't know if I am audible enough. Yes, you are. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Just wanna answer on the issue of the salmon. Uh, we need not to use the salmon right now. We just need to invite, as you have clearly uh, explained, that it's our role to get into the space when we get such information. And then for us to use a someone is when a person is refusing to come. Then now we need to do what we usually do of inviting whoever has to come and account or explain whatever they have to come and explain in assisting SCOPA to discharge its own duties. So we don't need to summon now. Let's write a letter inviting him on a day that will identify all of us and agree that he must come. And in terms of the procedure that we used to follow of writing a letter to someone after a whistleblower have come to us, they, that uh, process is very different. Why am I saying that? And there is no witch hunting here. I'm saying that because a whistleblower will come to us and say, DBSA did one, two, three, four, five. And then we write to DBSA. In this instance, we can't write to president simply because we have used such before. We want him, he's a whistleblower, just like other whistleblowers. He wasn't blown. He must then come and tell us who must we then start calling to the committee. It's simple like that. Thank you, Chair. I'm trying to bring this to <laughs> okay. It's fine. I, I take note of what you 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 say, Honorable Mente. It forms part of the proposals. Um, Macha and then Honorable Hatebe, and then we need to make now progress on this and make decisions, colleagues. Mam Macha, Honorable Hatebe, I'm over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Chairperson. My, my point is the same with Honorable Mente that we never mentioned the word someone. We, we, we propose that President be invited so that we get more information. So, the, someone is out of data uh, to as for today. The word invitation is the, the, best, the best word for us that let us invite the president, not to summon him. Thank you, Chairperson. Aye, so, over to you. No, no thanks, Nyabonga Slalo. Let me reiterate again that Chair Escopa and ANC in particular were prepared to take the bull by its horn in exercising our mandate to hold anyone, I mean anyone, accountable for the misappropriation of public funds. Having said that, Chair, all members who spoke have unanimously agreed someone don't arise at this stage. I repeat, there is no justification for that currently. It's unreasonable, unjustified, irrational, must be thrown out of the window. However, what we are proposing, for us to arrive at an informed decision, let us write to His Excellency, the Honorable Cyril Matamela Ramaphos, to respond in the writing to these allegations. First and foremost, once we have that information at our disposal, once we've engaged and interacted, we'll then proceed to the next step. Dealing with something in black and white makes it much easier for us to refer 
once an individual is before us. So I humbly request that we do not deviate from the norm throughout its existence in this sixth administration. This committee has never voted on any matter. Let us not vote now. It is clear and equivocal the issue of someone has been taken out. I submarine. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> okay. We have voted on a matter of a summons. And if colleagues are saying, because that's the issue, that's the formal request of Mr. Dux. And that's why I was saying it, we need to de decide on it, right? So I hear that colleagues, if you are saying we put that, uh, that request in abeyance and pursue a different direction, then that is perfectly fine. But for procedural correctness, uh, I wanted to make sure that it's your determination because summons are a committee decision. So uh, we will, so all right, Honorable Dirk, let me, I'll come to you, Honorable Fanmine. Okay, let me, let me take you now and then I'll just make a, a, a okay, Honorable Fanmine and then Honorable, Honorable Liz, right? Thank you very much, Chair. I would agree with the Honorable Mentor. Uh, this is a multi-party committee. We do not seek to achieve consensus and decisions. Therefore, I think we should not be afraid to vote. However, I agree with her on the issue of let us show um, some precedent and also to bring in what, what the Honourable Lise was proposing earlier. Let us invite the president to come and to, to answer various questions. I think we cannot just uh, direct those questions to him in writing. I think we do have to invite him to come. And that means we can always take this further Later, should he not come, should he demure to come, we then do have the option to look at other ways to get him in front of the committee. Thank you. All right, uh, Honourable Lees, you will be the last one on this one. Mr Chairman, suffice it to say that I would like to second the amendment to, to my draft um, proposal um, to include an invitation to the President as as suggested or as recommended by Honourable Mentor and Honourable Benedicta. Um, so I'm happy with that. Thank you. All right, colleagues, <clears throat> let's do this. Uh, Honourable Dix, we, we will at this point uh, accept that a summons is a last resort. Uh, because the President of the Republic has not shown cause not to cooperate, uh, amongst other things, because we have not interacted with him, nor have we communicated uh, this matter to um, him. Uh, we will hold the issue of the summons and abeyance, um, and with the understanding that we reserve the right as the committee to make use of it in the event that there is no um, cooperation. So I will, we will suspend the issue of the summons at this point. Colleagues, I would like to, if I may, merge all the proposals now so that we are structured in our approach. I think that we must, um, put this matter to the president and seek his response to it in terms of a, a, a two-pronged approach. One phase one is exactly that. And why do I, 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 do, I do this? A written submission by the president enables the committee to plan correctly for hearings. So there is a need for us to receive either a statement, explanation, or an affidavit from the president in that he must be advised that upon receipt of that information, the committee will make a determination on the process of hearings on this matter. So he does need to furnish us with information.
two, the president is now not the only implicated uh, stakeholder, uh, for lack of a better phrase, or, or entity in this matter. I think that the state security agency must provide an explanation or a representation or an affidavit to the committee on this matter. If you listen very closely to the issues that um, Honorable Mend in particular raised, and that we must advise the, the Joint Standing Committee on Intelligence that before us there's a matter which has got a direct and material bearing on the State Security Agency. And the third party is the Auditor General. We need the Auditor General to indicate uh, to us in writing about these matters. If you listen to the, um, the recording, I mean, to the legal opinion. Now, <clears throat> There's a very then, so I, I think that we, we need to be very structured then, colleagues. So I was going to um, say that we agree that we must take this matter forward uh, as a fact finding mission to ascertain the material relevant facts um, of it. Noting also now that Honorable Dirk has instituted another parallel process in writing to the public protector about this matter and an in intention to write to the Deputy Chief Justice in his capacity as the chairperson of the Commission of Inquiry into Allegations of State of Capture. So we will need, there will need to be a meeting of minds now in terms of how we wade through those issues and so speed and agency, because I'm not sure if it is prudent for uh, the investigation of the public protector to take precedence um, ahead of what we are doing when this matter, which in my view is ground zero of this information that before we have completed it now and then another process is going on. So there's that level of, I would say, I wouldn't wanna call it, yeah, urgency of sorts. So colleagues, yes, let us put it to the president uh, with the explicit proviso that we reserve our right to invite him to appear before us uh, and most likely that um, that will happen on the basis of the presentations that he will make um, to us. Um, because if we speak about precedents, that's what we did with the DBSA matter. We have sought them to bring matters in writing. We are just awaiting the whistleblower to actually appear before us. And that date was not secured in December, 2021. So, now, there was a proposal of seven days. Um, th there's that. Um, so, I was, yeah, so colleagues, that's, I, wa I was thinking, can we have a two tier approach to this matter? Um, so that we, if, we, if we have meaningful engagements when we have the hearings um, and establish the material facts. Um, accordingly. So that's the, I'm trying to merge, you know, and have a meeting of minds about how we take um, this particular matter forward. Um, and so I, I would like to put that to you, um, colleagues, as a roadmap um, of the um, committee's fact-finding mission um, or inquiry um, into um, these allegations as a as, as of course we've deemed it necessary to be so. Honorable Somio, I see your hand is up. No, thank you very much, uh, Chair. Um, I, I just wanted to deal with your summary 
as per our broad discussion and the legal advice that we have received and the correspondence from Honorable Member Dax. The primary subject of Honorable Member Dax is the President of the Republic. Based uh, on the actual recording, which also needs to be confirmed and authenticated. It's a matter that is in front of us. So if we afford the president uh, an opportunity through a written response, that's the confirmation of matters which are in front of us as a subject of such a complaint by Honorable Dax. At this time and moment, I don't think we are sure whether we must go for inquiry or anything else, except for the fact that we must determine through that response where it takes us as a committee, what form of a hearing we must hold uh, based on the qualitative nature of such a response. So I would want to propose, Chair, that uh, let's not throw away the proposition which has been made by Honorable Hadebe in the first instance. If you would want to match, match the existing proposals, one coming from Honorable Bias uh, together with what comes to honorable, from Honorable Hadebe which is clear uh, in terms of options which are available based on the practice. And, and uh, we, should, we should as well exercise a sense of caution for predictability in the system seeks to create an authoritative sense of the direction which would be taken by institution when certain things occur. Even in this matter, there is no direction or misdirection that we must uh, look for a route which is different from what we have been uh, undertaking all along. So, 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 so uh, writing to the president, making the president aware that we have received this correspondence, which has got these primary issues and seeking that response, and based on that response, yes, I agree that it might be that uh, there will be time that we seek to determine what form do we have to take uh, in terms of uh, eliciting uh, some further information if it needs be. Let's not spread our wings unnecessarily because at the moment, the subject is at the president's uh, site, nothing else except that. Thank you very much, Chair. Okay. Right, colleagues, let's, let's, let's do this then. Um, let us write to the president. Um, to solicit and establish facts um, and an explanation uh, from him on this issue. Um, understanding uh, that we will reserve our right as a committee to invite him and also at the same time, inform the other affected parties of the same. And that explanation or written response or statement or affidavit from the president in this regard to, because I think it's pretty straightforward um, actually, um, to uh, reach us. Uh, so we'll dispatch it tomorrow. 
um, latest um, Thursday. Uh, and so, and give the president um, seven to 10 days to respond to that. Um, and then that response will lay the foundation um, on the nature of nature and shape of our investigation into this matter. I, I would like to reiterate that um, we will reserve our right, we do, um, to invite the president. And I also must stress that um, ordinarily, um, hearings follow submissions. Uh, but I also do believe that it, it is in the collective interests of good governance that when such a matter uh, arises from the president of the Republic, that he has a discussion, a very frank one, with parliament through the Standing Committee on Public Accounts, which is charged with the responsibility of watching and protecting the public purse. It's an unavoidable um, interaction. So I think let us start there, colleagues. Give the president um, seven to 10 days to respond uh, to the material issues we will place before him. Um, and then we will have a meeting on the basis of that response. Um, so we will schedule it accordingly when we receive um, that submission um, and then take it forward in that fashion. So I think <clears throat> the committee will then um, pronounce itself at that point. Can I make, uh, of course we will write to state security and the Auditor General to advise them that this is such a matter um, and I think um, I should also say that we must also advise the public protector that um, we are dealing with a particular aspect now of the issue which has been brought before her by Mr. Dex, um, so that we maintain a healthy cooperation of all the institutions of the state um, as contained in the constitution and um, the rules of the house. I think that will be a proper and correct um, thing to do um, so that uh, there's no confusion or duplication of activities um, on issues. So I would hope colleagues that that suffices. Um, so um, parliament legal um, and secretariat We'll set up a meeting and finalize the drafting of the correspondence to the president and dispatch it um, consistent with the outlook that the committee has maintained today that this is a matter of a serious nature which requires um, its attention and that um, the president must provide the committee um, with information on the basis of the utterances attributed to him in the recording um, as sent to us. I would hope that is a 